Thank you. It's funny how uh, you, I've come to that stage in my career when the most important thing about me that's announced is that I'm on that Time magazine list. Uh, just, just, just to give you a little bit of an idea who uh, is with me on that list include Kim Kardashian, who, <laughs> who, who my son thinks deserves it more than I do, uh, as well as the founder of Boko Haram. So actually the list can mean anything to anyone. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, for me anyway, it was a, a big recognition of um, you know, the idea that mental health services are required in all countries of the world, and that the myth that has often existed around mental health, particularly in the poorest parts and the poorest populations of the world, uh, the myth that these individuals have more important or pressing concerns to deal with in the global health and development agenda is one that we must discard, for the evidence clearly shows that mental health problems affect people in all societies, in all cultures, and if anything, in fact, people who are disadvantaged, excluded, marginalized, and impoverished, in fact, suffer a much greater burden of mental health problems. But my talk today is not so much about the burden of mental illness, because I'm hoping most of you in this room already are aware of why this is an important problem, not just in rich countries, but in the global context. Instead, I'm here to share with you the excitement of solutions. Solutions about how this burden can be addressed in some of the most resource poor settings in the world, and hopefully along the way to demonstrate to you how some of the rich countries of the world, such as here in Sweden, can in fact learn very important lessons from the creativity and ingenuity that arises in some of the poorest parts of the world. That is why I have called this title Psychological Treatments for the World. It is not only for the developing world that I will be sharing with you some important lessons, but for all populations of the world, and ultimately, that is really the most important promise of the field of global health more generally, and global mental health more specifically. So let me just quickly tell you a little bit about the discipline of global mental health in brief. Uh, this is the discipline of global health. It brings together the principles of uh, highest principles of clinical interventions and research alongside those of public health, but with a very strong commitment to social justice and equity. The idea that one of the most unacceptable aspects of our society are health inequalities. The inequalities in health that grade people into those who have worse outcomes purely and simply often because they're socially more disadvantaged than peop other people in their own community. But health inequalities don't only exist within populations, they also exist between populations. And the biggest health inequalities, at least in terms of resources, are those inequalities between rich countries and developing countries. So for example, and I'll touch on this in a moment, a 90 to 95% of all the resources for mental health, such as, for example, human resources like psychologists, the number of dollars that is spent per capita, etc. 95% of all resources for mental health are actually being delivered in countries that account for only 5% of the world's population. That's a huge inequity and an unfairness. And so it isn't surprising that although global health and global mental health really are concerned with health equity in all populations, rich and poor, the focus of these disciplines currently is to reduce the inequalities between rich and poor countries. And global mental health, therefore, has historically also focused primarily on health concerns, mental health concerns, in low- and middle-income countries. I'm going to focus today's talk on psychological treatments, and particularly psychological treatments uh, for adults with depressive and anxiety disorders. I choose depressive and anxiety disorders primarily because these are, by far and away, the leading causes of the mental health burden of disease globally. I also choose psychological treatments because they are by far and away the most evidence-based interventions we have for mental health disorders. In fact, psychological treatments are now recommended as the first-line treatments for a range of conditions, not just depressive and anxiety disorders, but also, for example, for a number of substance use disorders. And I will also briefly describe, uh, tell you a little bit about my work uh, with alcohol use conditions. They're also the only intervention for many children with developmental disorders such as autism. There are no pharmacological interventions for this group of children. So in many ways, s if there was one major group of, condition, uh, of treatments, that spanned effectiveness across the full range of mental, neurological, and developmental disorders, it would in fact be the psychological therapies. Now, a key concern in the field of global mental health is what is the coverage of these evidence-based interventions. Uh, 
And it has to be said that if one had to look at the coverage in countries where I work, for example, in India, particularly in rural India, or in many parts of Africa, I can tell you quite confidently, I don't need to do any studies to tell you that virtually 0% of people with depressive and anxiety disorders, and indeed any of these different mental health conditions which could benefit from psychological therapies, are actually receiving these treatments. So therefore, it's a 100% treatment gap. In most parts of the developing world where mental health care is being delivered, it is almost entirely a pharmacological delivery. And so if I had to look at psychological treatments, the delivery system has completely failed in achieving coverage. Now there are two very important barriers to uh, addressing this enormous problem. Uh, of course, a supply side barrier, and I will come back to touch on this in a moment, uh, is the one that we all are very familiar with. The supply side barrier simply means that we do not have sufficient mental health professionals uh, who are skilled in the delivery of psychological treatments in most parts of the world. But I don't think we also acknowledge that there is a demand side barrier. And this I will return to in the end of my talk. And the demand side barrier is simply this, that the kind of biomedical models that modern mental health professionals uh, try to advocate derived, for example, from diagnostic systems like ICD and DSM, are simply not acceptable to most people in the community. There is a fundamental gap between how ordinary communities and ordinary people understand distress and disorder, at least in the area of depression and anxiety, and how biomedical models frame these particular problems. Now, over the last 10 or 15 years, Innovators in global mental health working in some of the most resource-poor countries around the world have been trying to address these barriers. The field of global mental health, probably the most important contribution that global mental health has made beyond demonstration of the burden and impact of mental disorders is actually in the field of psychological treatments. On a commission from the Annual Review of Clinical Psychology for their annual issue for next year, I was asked to lead a team of uh, researchers to really review the entire evidence base around uh, psychological treatments. And today is the first time I have an opportunity to present some of these results to you, uh, mainly because this particular review has only just been accepted for publication. So what we did, led by my colleague Daisy Singler in the University of Toronto, is we did a systematic review uh, right up until uh, March of last year, of, of this year. Um, we focus, as I mentioned earlier, on common mental disorders. What we mean by common mental disorders would, in the diagnostic systems, include mood disorders, anxiety disorders, the full range of anxiety disorders, and trauma-related disorders. It was delivery by a non-specialist worker, and I will return to this theme a little bit later. Uh, we wanted to emphasize delivery by non-specialist workers because, of course, there are almost no specialists in most parts of the world. By specialists, I mean psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers with the mental health training, and psychiatric nurses. So we wanted to only limit ourselves to evidence where the treatment was delivered by a non-specialized worker. And incredibly, we found 27 randomized controlled trials from 22 countries. Now, to give you a little bit of a sense of how, uh, it, how significant this body of evidence is, this uh, number of trials for task sharing of a health intervention exceeds almost every single area of global health, with the only exception being infectious diseases. So it exceeds almost all uh, 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 task sharing uh, uh, trials in the areas, say, for example, of diabetes and hypertension. It is the single largest body of evidence on task sharing uh, from a non-communicable disease field. When we try to synthesize all of these different uh, trials into three very important questions, uh, we found that there were some very unique and innovative ways in which people working in these settings were transforming our understanding of what comprises a psychological intervention, who is the provider of su such a psychological intervention, in other words, who is a mental health provider, and thirdly, how and where these interventions are delivered. In the next few slides, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first show you the orthodox model, what I often refer to as the purely biomedical model uh, of, delivering, uh, of understanding these questions. And then I'm going to summarize some of the high point results from our review to demonstrate how people working in low resource settings have often challenged that biomedical model and presented these treatments in very different ways. 
So let's start with what comprises psychological treatments. Of course, some of you may di disagree with uh, my generalizations here, but they are meant to be generalizations, really to bring uh, to the fore how different or contrasting the approaches are uh, in different parts of the world. So typically, the orthodox biomedical model, such as the one that uh, the, the World Health Organization uh, would advocate, is that the first point at which you have to decide what treatment you, 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 you receive is determined by a diagnosis. The diagnosis requires you to classify people into those who have a mental disorder or not, but even further, those who have a mental disorder have to be further classified into various subcategories of mental disorders. The problem, of course, as I mentioned earlier, is that in most parts of the world, and certainly all the parts of the world that I work in, most of these disorders mean nothing at all to most of the people who we diagnose them with. The next important challenge is that we then ask the, uh, in, uh, the, the, the mental health provider to choose a particular treatment package for that particular disorder. So there is now a mushrooming of treatment packages in the psychological world. Uh, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a recent um, accounting of the number of treatment packages just for children and adolescents, and the number exceeded 100 that had been actually evaluated in randomized control trials, 100 different treatment packages with different names. So you can immediately see how challenging it might be for anyone in the real world to know what package to deliver or what package to be trained in. And then finally, uh, most of these packages, uh, the evidence-based guidelines only really uh, treat uh, mental disorders with uh, a very narrow set of interventions, typically just pharmacological interventions or Western packages of psychological treatments. The problem with, of course, these approaches is that neither of these interventions are either easily accessible or affordable. So, how did the global mental health innovators actually deal with this? The first thing is, most global mental health innovators don't use diagnoses. So they have almost completely discarded the idea of having to categorize people into multiple diagnostic groups, but instead work with symptoms and distress, and particularly work with function as the most important outcome, so that the the guidance of the therapy, of the treatment, is not whether or not you recover from depression, but whether or not an outcome that you consider very important, usually in the social world that you live, uh, can actually be addressed adequately. Another very important element of our review was to look at the treatments that these 27 different trials had evaluated and look at the content of the treatments. And we found that actually, no matter which particular disorder or which particular setting uh, or which particular population uh, this, uh, tr uh, the, the, the treatment was being evaluated in, in fact, the treatments looked very similar. And so here was the prospect that if we wanted to scale up these treatments, rather than have to train people in these different packages for different disorders, we might in fact simply look at a very limited set of techniques that you can see some examples of on this slide. Training people just in these techniques can potentially allow you to in fact scale up these treatments in very diverse contexts and populations. And finally, there was also the notion of stepped care. Uh, so that people with milder distress states were shifted out of the biomedical system and instead provided what really most of them needed was social work interventions, interventions that primarily targeted uh, their social problems, low-intensity interventions like befriending, typically, for example, for other people who had recovered uh, from mental health problems and so on. So there was an element of step care, which, of course, is a very efficient way uh, of delivering care for conditions in which there is a spectrum of severity. The second important uh, question was who provided these treatments. The orthodox model is people with a very specialized training in mental health, such as the people who are listed on this slide, but I've probably missed a few other important groups, such as psychiatric nurses as well. But this is the orthodox model. Again, as I said, I'm generalizing here. Uh, no doubt in many parts of the world, many other uh, uh, providers have now become, uh, as it were, counted as mental health providers. But the orthodox model I certainly trained in uh, was this one. Now, here's the problem. I come and live in a country of 1.2 billion people, but I work in an institution in a country which has about 65 million people and where I train in psychiatry, which is Britain. So if I had to take the ratio of psychiatrists just as one category of mental health professionals, uh, the ratio of psychiatrists to the population in Britain, and I had to then translate that ratio to India and say, how many psychiatrists do we need in India to have the same ratio? With a population of 1.2 billion people, we would expect about 150,000 mental health professionals. By this, I mean psychiatrists. The true number, of course, 
is a very minuscule number. 5,000, in fact, includes potentially people on the register who are no longer practicing. Also probably includes quite a few psychiatrists who have since emigrated. The true number, it is believed, is about 3,000 psychiatrists. Now, to give you a sense of what 3,000 means, 3,000 psychiatrists is roughly the number of psychiatrists in New York State in the US. Um, and we have a population of 1.2 billion people. Now, this, another way of putting this, is that actually this is one of the best resource countries in the world uh, because India actually has more than 100 medical schools churning out psychiatrists. So this is a good scenario in terms of mental health professionals when you consider low and mid income work. So clearly the, I the orthodox idea which is that you can deliver frontline care using mental health professionals is not going to be feasible or affordable for the foreseeable future. Those of you may wonder, there surely must be more clinical psychologists. In many developing countries, you have a perverse reversal of the uh, kind of picture of human resources that you see in the West, which is that you have more doctors than you have uh, non-physician health workers. So therefore, you have more psychiatrists in India than you have clinical psychologists. Uh, and of course, a lot of this is driven, uh, as you, might, be, uh, uh, you know, might, might have expected, through for, for commercial reasons. So how does the global mental health uh, uh, sector uh, you know, address this? Well, first of all, of course, we pre-selected only those papers that had non-specialized workers. But let me tell you, when we did a review, there were actually no papers that had specialized workers because actually there are very few. And where they did exist, they were purely drug trials that had been done in hospitals for licensing purposes. So the frontline providers, as you can see here, by far and away, the biggest chunk were community health workers. Community health workers are a major workforce in the maternal and child health areas, also in HIV, in malaria control, et cetera. So these are generic frontline workers. Uh, to give you an example of the kind of worker I might, I might use in India, the ASHA worker uh, typically is a woman from the local community. Uh, her education level is that she's a school graduate, but probably not gone beyond that. She is literate, um, uh, but she's pretty much an ordinary woman in the community, selected often by the community to become a frontline worker, and she primarily delivers maternal and child health services. The second important group, and I think this is really exciting, a group that we have underutilized, which is peers. These are people who themselves might have had an experience of a mental health problem. Mind you, this is only common mental disorders in this particular review. Um, but it could also be others who may share some other characteristics. So for example, with young people, the peer may not necessarily be, uh, be a person who's had depression or anxiety. It could actually be another young person. In the case of maternal depression, an area I'm working in a lot right now, the peer may be another mother uh, who, from the community who shared a common experience of being a mother and therefore can empathize uh, with, with that experience of motherhood. And then you've got a few formal uh, pr providers but who are non-specialists in the sense that they have no mental health training. Now, mental health specialists do play roles. It's not that they're absent from this whole program. They play a number of very important roles that you can see here, such as training, supervision, uh, receiving, as well as providing referrals uh, to, other pro uh, to other specialists. For example, a, a, a woman who, uh, who is pregnant and who might need uh, a specific obstetric referral for some reason or the other. They do play roles. And so this continues to be a very important role that mental health professionals play. One of the important challenges is how do we further scale up this particular role in a non-specialist environment. Because if mental health specialists are needed for all these roles in these trials, there is still a barrier to scaling up this knowledge because, of course, the barrier will still be that we don't have enough mental health specialists. Later on, I will share with you one particular uh, innovation uh, in my own work in, in recent years that is potentially even reducing the need of mental health specialists in these particular roles. And finally, how are these interventions provided? The orthodox model is typically they're provided in the practitioner's clinic, which is typically in a mental health care facility or a big hospital or a private office. Now, for most mental health providers in the developing world, uh, the kind of office or hospital they will work in will look a bit like this. This is by far and away one of the places where some of the worst human rights abuses that currently we will see against any population, I don't mean just simply uh, people with mental illness, I mean against any population anywhere in the world, continue to be perpetrated in these asylums, in these mental hospitals that are dotted across the landscape of a Asia and Africa in particular, but also in many parts of Eastern Europe uh, and Latin America. These are institutions that were built 
often by colonial powers. There are institutions that have continued even as the colonial powers have dismantled their hospitals. And they continue to be the place where most mental health resources are concentrated. Let me give you an actual example. In India, 80% of all psychiatric beds, 80% of all psychiatric beds are located in 37 mental hospitals, 36 of which were built before 1947 when India became independent. They are the classic asylums in which you used to lock people with mental illness away and simply throw away the key. Now, of course, if this is the kind of care you're going to receive when you go to these institutions, you can immediately appreciate that nobody wants to go to these institutions. The, the poor individuals who land up in these institutions are typically people with very serious mental disorders and disabilities, often abandoned by their families uh, and picked up by the police. So they're pretty, ho pretty horrific places. So how does global mental health address this? Well, instead of actually asking people to come to see the provider, the provider goes to wherever the person actually lives. And the central element, and of course I think this is true of global health more generally, is to tailor healthcare delivery to the convenience of our patients. To consider the patient as the primary center of our thinking about healthcare rather than the provider. And it always strikes me as very interesting in mental health care, we put the provider at the center of all our planning uh, so that we expect the patient to actually fit in with our schedules. Instead, for example, in developing countries, recognizing that for many patients with mental health problems, during the daytime when we work, actually many of them are also working. Um, and that to come for regular therapy sessions means they have to take a day off their work. And if they're day wage laborers, which is the case for most people, uh, it means that they lose a day's income. So even if your therapy is so-called free, there are very big indirect costs uh, for that individual. Simple economics of this kind act as enormous barriers to completing psychotherapy, for example, which may need six to eight sessions, uh, and indeed also completing pharmacotherapy. So as you can see here, the community, which is places like, for example, community centers, people's own homes, uh, uh, schools, etc., uh, are important uh, uh, venues of delivering care. Primary care, uh, well, actually, uh, here on this slide, we've separated community, primary care, and home, and you can see if you add them all up, uh, they're basically uh, the overwhelming number of settings in which uh, uh, these treatments are delivered. So you can see a very different framing of what a mental health care uh, a delivery site might be. And how are they delivered? The first couple of points are not terribly surprising. I'm sure many of you will be doing this as well in Sweden with, for example, refugee populations. You'll really be tailoring uh, these mat the, the, the intervention materials to be culturally appropriate, not just for language, but also for literacy. Uh, so, for example, we tend to use a lot more visual aids uh, rather than uh, 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 using uh, uh, written materials. Similarly, uh, collaboration with communities, so you, you, we don't see psychological treatments or mental health care as some kind of isolated clinical intervention. In many of these different programs, there is a robust partnership between the provider and other key community agencies, for example, uh, 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 beyond the community health worker, uh, important key informants in the community who can help engagement uh, of people uh, with mental health care. And the final point is really important. These are brief sessions. These are brief treatments. On average, from six to 10 sessions, this is pretty short. If you consider the orthodox models of psychotherapy where this would be considered very brief treatments, this is in fact the norm in most low resource settings. Uh, and mostly in the individual format, we can talk about why group formats may not always be that easy to use in, in, in these settings. And over very short periods of time, the focus is very much on quick recovery so that you can get back to doing the things you like to do and sometimes the doing the things you need to do uh, in order to be functional and productive in your day-to-day -day life. So there's a very strong focus on early and quick recovery um, across all of these interventions. So the big question many of you will have is do they actually work? Uh, I'm sorry, the forest plot here is not very readable for people at the back, uh, but I want you to just focus on this summary estimate here. For those of you who can't read, this is an effect size uh, across all the primary depression, anxiety, and stress-related disorder outcomes, and you can see an effect size of about 0.5, which I'm pretty sure for those of you who, who are familiar with how to in interpret Cohen's effect sizes, you will know that's a moderate to strong effect size. Um, in other words, with all of these 
different changes that have been made in the way psychological treatments are designed, delivered. Uh, in fact, you still have effect sizes that are fairly comparable to the ones you might see uh, in the psychotherapy literature from high-income countries. So this is the key conclusion of this review, that innovations which reflect the attempt at utilizing local, affordable, and sustainable resources. Mind you, we're using community health workers, many of them who already are, in fact, working in the system, uh, including, uh, and which deliver brief treatments uh, and accessible settings, retain very high levels of effectiveness comparable to the psychotherapy uh, literature that you might see in high-income countries. And in doing so, I believe these innovations have redefined not only what is a psychological treatment, but very importantly, who is a mental health care provider and what is a setting in which mental health care can be provided. Now, for those of you who would like to see a little bit more about these different innovations, I've only been uh, very focused on randomized control trials. Of course, we all know that this is only one kind of evidence. There's a lot of other kind of evidence out there in the global mental health field that is reshaping our understanding of how to address mental health problems. Uh, for those of you who want to look at this larger landscape uh, of global mental health, uh, maybe look also at different kind of health conditions like psychosis, uh, children with mental health problems and so on, uh, I'd, I'd suggest you go to this website. Uh, this is the Mental Health Innovation Network. Anyone can join this network, become part of this growing global movement, uh, but also on this network, you will also find an amazing resource uh, of innovations complete with tools, uh, manuals, uh, evidence for each of those innovations, and you can also search for these innovations by, for example, country, uh, the target group, etc. Now, if I had to sort of summarize all of this into a single slide, and if someone had to ask me, uh, you know, what is the single lesson uh, that we, if we want to design a mental health intervention, a behavior change intervention, because actually these lessons are not only true for psychological treatments, they apply pretty much across all behavior change interventions, say HIV counseling, breastfeeding counseling, etc. If I had to take a single lesson out of all of this uh, uh, evidence, uh, I coined this, 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 this acronym, some of you may have seen an earlier talk of mine, uh, where I use this acronym for the first time, it's a Hindi word that means sundar, um, uh, which means um, attractive, it's simple and attractive. Um, and if I had to look at how we actually tar share interventions, uh, this, these are the key ingredients, I think, that really pretty much summarize across all of these different interventions what the innovators have done. Um, they've simplified the message, for example, by stripping away biomedical jargon, big words, uh, technical diagnostic labels that no one understands. They've unpacked complicated treatments by breaking them down into smaller and simpler techniques and strategies. And I'll come back to how this is also changing the way psychotherapies are being designed now. They've delivered these treatments where people are, not where the provider is. So they've let the treatments go viral. And of course, very soon we will see a digital revolution, which will make this even more likely to happen without any human interface. They've used affordable and available human resources, whoever is in the community, a peer, a teacher, a community health worker, rather than asking the question, what resource do we not have? They've asked the exact opposite question. How can we use the resources that we do have in a way that can deliver these interventions, which I think changes our notion quite dramatically of what is an under-resourced community. Because if we turn around our lens to resources to say that anybody with appropriate training and supervision can become a mental health provider, then of course every society, every community actually has adequate resources. It's about how we utilize them that becomes the challenge. And then we reallocate the very scarce and precious resource of specialists into higher order tasks of training, of quality assurance and providing referral services because admittedly there will be individuals with very severe problems uh, for whom task sharing may not be adequate. And we have to accept that and acknowledge that. But you can begin to see here that this is a pyramidal system with a step care approach, with a specialist playing the kind of roles that deserve that kind of training and skill. Now, for many for many years, actually, working in the global mental health field, you know, one of the constant critics, uh, or critiques rather, was really the cultural question. To what extent are the psychotherapies that are developed in Western contexts translatable, transferable, generalizable to non-Western settings, where illness beliefs about mental health problems could be very different? And I'm sure 
that there are, there are people here in this room who work in the cross-cultural space, particularly uh, in, you know, who, who've had experience with anthropology, you will immediately recognize these sorts of concerns. What was curious when we looked at these, uh, these the, the adaptations that took place in these psychotherapies, and here I'm referring to an earlier review we did, which looked at the adaptations uh, for depression interventions both in minority populations in countries like the US, with African-American minorities, for example, as well as in the developing world, two very amazing findings uh, uh, came up, and they're shown on the slide. The first is that the adaptations were almost identical when people sought to improve access to psychological treatments for minorities, like, for example, African-Americans in the US. This got me thinking that it isn't culture that is the big divider, it's social class. That is to say, people who are poor, impoverished, disadvantaged in any society have poorer access to psychological treatments. And the reasons for that are the same no matter what culture you come from. Because poverty and social disadvantage disadvantages you in many similar ways across the world in accessing psychological treatments, but also that the psychological treatments are too arcane, they're too biomedical, they're too removed from the day-to-day -day lived experience of poor people, no matter where you are. The second important uh, observation was that contrary to what I myself believed when I started in this field, I thought, in fact, that these interventions would not generalize. So, you know, it's interesting for me as a researcher, I have found evidence that was contrary to my own hypotheses and assumptions. I have found exactly the opposite, as have many of my colleagues around the world, that in fact these treatments do travel across cultures. They travel wonderfully well, as you just saw in that meta-analysis. Um, and actually, the adaptations are relatively trivial. There are adaptations like the ones I showed you, but there's nothing against the theory the basic theory of why these mood and anxiety disorders occur and the interventions you target uh, for those particular mechanisms remains the same no matter where you are. And of course that's reassuring a little bit because I would like to think that human beings think and feel and behave in ways that are also universal. And we're not all peculiarly different species of people um, who have completely different ways of our brains working. I want to now turn to the second part of my talk, which is where do we go from here? What, what do we, what, uh, you know, how do we take this exciting evidence and actually disseminate this? How do we make these interventions, these incredibly effective interventions that can be delivered by very low-cost human resources in everyday settings? How do we take this knowledge base and take it to scale? And I wrote a lot about this with my, with my mentor, Chris Fairburn, recently. And I'm going to actually summarize some of the really exciting stuff that is happening out there and look ahead into the future about where this field might be going. So uh, where we're going with this field is really reimagining and re-engineering psychological treatments for global mental health. And in global mental health, I mean all areas of global health in which a behavior change intervention has a role. And there are three particular approaches uh, that I'm going to talk about. First, to try and bring together the rich experiences of innovators from around the world to come up with a clear-cut methodology for the design of behavior change interventions whose primary goal is scalability. That is to say, we want to scale these up in the real world using whatever available uh, resources uh, are out there. The second is beginning to move away from diagnoses, which is already happening, but to embrace the idea that similar treatments can address multiple diagnoses, something that in the psychological treatment world is often referred to as transdiagnostic treatments. And I'll come back to examples of each of these now. And the third, of course, is novel approaches to disseminate treatments, the most novel one, of course, using technology, digital platforms. And I'll talk about each of these three with examples now. Let me turn to the first example, which is to, to really synthesize the knowledge base on the design of psychological and psychosocial interventions into a codified methodology so that the same methodology can then be applied to any particular target condition or any particular intervention. About six or seven years ago, um, I was funded by the Wellcome Trust uh, to set up this program that sought to do exactly that. It was, it's a program called Premium. And our goal was to, to use the lessons from around the world to define a methodology that could design treatments, behavior change interventions, that fulfilled two important goals, that they were acceptable, so it addressed the demand side goal, they were acceptable to communities and populations who had never previously had psychological therapies. 
Mind you, I work in a place in which nobody has ever received a diagnosis of depression and nobody has ever received a psychological therapy. This is a very particular kind of population, but in fact, this is the rule in the global context, not the exception. So you have to develop treatments which will actually be acceptable to this treatment-naive population, and of course, uh, which can be delivered by frontline workers. And then, to apply this methodology to develop treatments, we chose uh, severe depression and harmful and dependent drinking as test conditions in which this methodology could be applied, uh, and we evalu evaluated the impact of that. Now, you might wonder why we chose these conditions. Uh, we chose these conditions because the World Health Organization's MHCAP Intervention Guide, some of you will know it, it's the, um, it's the World Health Organization's flagship program in mental health. And as you can see here, it's a treatment guideline uh, 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 algorithm for mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. And if you look at the guide, you will find that for both of these mental health conditions, uh, these psychological therapies were recommended as first-line treatments. But of course, the guide had no real uh, uh, you know, clar clarity on how these treatments could be delivered. Nevertheless, since they were already, in fact, included in the um, uh, manual, we decided to actually choose these two conditions. The other reason we, of course, chose uh, them was because depression and alcohol use disorders are the number one and number two mental health causes of the global burden of disease. So the research questions that we thought were important in thinking about uh, 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 how we design treatments were firstly, what is the architecture of the treatment? What goes into the treatment? And most importantly, what is the theory of the treatment? It's extremely important in my mind that anything we do in this space must be guided by a theory which we can then in fact go back to, to test whether in fact our assumptions uh, were right. Uh, so a key element is the components and why these components will lead to the outcome that we actually w desire to see. And the methods, uh, the, the principle rather, that we, we were guided by was that we knowing that actually these treatments tend to be quite universal, that we wanted to be guided by the international evidence rather than reject it. We thought the global evidence was extremely important, including that from, non -west, uh, from Western populations. But we wanted to also bring into play local evidence, particularly evidence about coping strategies and helping strategies that has, had historically been utilized in that society. Just because psychotherapies don't exist in most parts of the world, and just because most people haven't received a diagnosis with depression, it didn't mean that there weren't people with depression who were doing something to help themselves recover. I often used to argue and said, people weren't waiting around for psychology and psychiatry to emerge. People have been helping themselves for generations, for millennia, because these conditions are as old uh, as mankind. So let's figure out what people have been doing and where these are relevant strategies, integrate them with the treatment. And the second is, how should it be delivered? I think we've talked a lot about that, essentially addressing barriers and challenges in the delivery of the intervention, particularly to optimize the feasibility and acceptability of these treatments. We came up with three broad steps. The first step was to identify potential psychological treatment strategies. What do I mean by strategies? So problem solving, behavioral activation, and so on. And we did that through systematically reviewing the literature and qualitative research with communities, with affected people, with traditional healers, and so on. The second important and very, very complex step is developing a theory of change. Uh, how do these different components actually get sequenced and delivered? Uh, how do they actually act towards producing the final outcome that we desire? What are the interim outcomes, uh, as it were, the mediators that could actually ultimately lead to the final outcome, which would be recovery from the condition? And then finally, we did pilot studies where we would clinical case series in which we would test the intervention uh, in cohorts of individuals and in iterative loops, keep refining the intervention until we reach that sweet spot of, ult uh, of optimal acceptability and feasibility. As a result of this, we, in, uh, we, 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 we published uh, two treatments, the Healthy Activity Program, which is built around a behavioral activation framework. Uh, six to eight sessions, very much uh, aligned with the uh, literature out there, uh, delivered over three phases uh, at weekly to fortnightly intervals over three months. This was, of course, for severe depression. And by severe depression, I, did, I really do mean severe depression. We were not taking mild and moderate depressed uh, individuals, again, for resource reasons. Uh, depression is extremely common, and our argument was that in very low resource settings, we should be really first and foremost uh, really targeting those who were most extremely unwell. And counseling for alcohol problems was pr primarily built around a foundation of motivational interviewing with some cognitive behavioral elements in there as well. Uh, as you can see, much shorter, this is very much in line with the alcohol field, uh, where much of the focus has happened on brief interventions uh, delivered over two months.
We've just completed the trials, and again, I'm really pleased to be presenting for the first, uh, first time the actual results of those trials for the primary endpoint. The papers will, be pub will appear uh, in the next three weeks in The Lancet. Um, but the important point is that, that you will hear the results first. The trials were amongst the largest in the field, nearly 500 individuals with severe depression and uh, just under 400 uh, with harmful drinking. We also have a secondary cohort of people with dependent drinking, and we're still analyzing the results from that. Uh, from 10 primary health centers, they were randomized into the psychological treatment that we developed with enhanced usual care versus enhanced usual care. I'm only presenting the three-month results today because that's the primary endpoint, and the 12-month uh, outcome data have just completed being collected. Uh, so we should be hopefully having those results. As you can see, a variety of outcomes, which is a hallmark of mental health trials. We're not satisfied only with clinical outcomes. We're also interested in social uh, and economic outcomes. But I think the most important point was this one here. And I think this was, a, when I look back in time and think about high-risk um, decisions made in research tr design, this was probably the most highest risk. Here, we made the decision that the same frontline worker would deliver both treatments. Now, if you know the, the treatment literature, the treatment uh, trial literature, that's never been done before. The idea that you can have two completely different treatments built around different theoretical frameworks being delivered by the same person in concurrent trials in the same settings. And why did we do this? Because of scalability. Because we knew right up, right, right up front that in the real world, we're never going to have a depression counselor and an alcohol counselor. So if we really wanted to examine how these treatments were effective in the real world, as close as possible, we had the same person being trained for both treatments and delivering both treatments at the same time in the same clinics such as you would find in the real world. So here are the results. Uh, the, um, this is the results for the primary endpoint for the depression trial. The first, the, the, the first bullet point is terribly important. 70% of these treatment-naive individuals completed treatment. If you look at, the, again, the literature from the West, this is actually a pretty respectable treatment completion rate uh, and reflects the acceptability of the treatment, the amount of work that went in for example, the language that was used in communicating the idea of depression to these individuals. The community health workers had very good fidelity as rated by independent behavioral activation experts in the US. Um, I'm not going to read out all the results. In a couple of weeks, you'll see them all uh, 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 published. But you know, as you can see from these figures here, uh, really important benefits, uh, but not just on mental health outcomes, but also across many other outcomes, inclu including an a priori hypothesis that helping women with depression recover would reduce the exposure to domestic violence. So this is a very exciting new literature that's emerging, which is, you know, we're very accustomed to thinking about domestic violence as a risk factor for depression. But in fact, it is also plausible through mechanisms we can discuss later on that actually helping women recover from depression may in fact give them agency to protect them from domestic violence. So that was the hypothesis uh, in, in this trial, and we were also demonstrating uh, uh, that in, in this study. And of course, we did an economic analysis, uh, which is uh, just briefly presented here. Similarly, the counseling for alcohol problems, which will be published as a companion paper in the same issue. Uh, again, you can see very high treatment acceptance rates. 70% of these, uh, this was only with men, by the way, because uh, in India, uh, alcohol uh, abuse problems are very gendered. Um, and so, uh, really, there's an overwhelming uh, preponderance of men. Of course, this does mean that our findings, sadly, do not generalize uh, uh, to, to how we understand treatment in women. Uh, but, but, but for the sake of the trial and the feasibility of the trial, we focused only on men. And again, as you can see here in these results, uh, uh, significant improvements across the alcohol outcomes. Um, and again, a reasonably high chance of being cost-effective. Mind you, these are pretty good results, although they're not as impressive as those for depression. For those of you who know the alcohol field, this is an incredibly tough condition to actually shift. Uh, and mind you, the average number of sessions was about two to three. So very few brief, this is truly a very brief treatment uh, uh, for, for, for harmful and dependent drinking. Uh, and we're hoping very much to build on this particular package of treatment to improve its effectiveness. I want to now just show you a brief video that shows you in two minutes a little bit about the experience of this intervention, showing you a couple of individuals who had this treatment and the, uh, my, my psychological treatment experts who actually were involved with designing the treatments. Now, uh, one of the important things I, I put a lot of emphasis on dissemination of evidence, and uh, I've tended over the last many years to start using uh, documentary films, uh, which are often filmed during the trial itself. Uh, and then, of course, we, we only make a big song and dance if we have good results. Um, so this is a first cut, by the way, which 
the, the main documentary is still being edited. It's a rough cut, um, and it's a two-minute of what is actually a 25-minute documentary, which will be released on the day the, the Lancet papers are published. <laughs> With depression, we have developed a very specific treatment called the Healthy Activity Program. Uh, this is a treatment that's based on the concept that when people become depressed, uh, they stop doing activities that they typically do. For example, they may be social withdrawal, uh, they may not be able to keep up with their work demands, uh, they may stop doing pleasurable activities. The less they do, the worse they're likely to feel. Alcohol use disorders are a collection of a range of alcohol problems which are of increasing severity and can be called as hazardous drinking, harmful drinking and dependent drinking. Counseling for Alcohol Problems or CAP is an intervention that's been developed for harmful drinkers. So we have a range of patients who come to primary care. Some of them might not regard their drinking as a problem. Some of them are not aware that their drinking is causing any problems. Some of them are aware that their drinking is a problem but don't want to do anything about it. And then there are others who are aware of their drinking problems and want to change their behaviors. Our treatment is designed to cater to all of these different types of patients. <laughs> So that's just a brief uh, uh, video, but there's a longer documentary which also describes the whole story of how these treatments were developed. But anyway, the key conclusions from this part um, is that brief psychological treatments between two and six sessions uh, for severe depression and harmful drinking are acceptable, feasible, and cost-effective. And I think the most important point I've already made, and I'll emphasize it again, that these were delivered by the same health worker in routine primary care to treatment-naive populations. Now, scaling up this delivery is a problem when we consider the issue of quality and two different innovations that we worked on during the course of premium was to develop measures of therapist competence. Uh, so this is a measure that was recently published. It's a measure that can be used by any behavior change intervention because many behavior change interventions, in fact, I would say all of them, share some common general principles of what makes a therapist competent and deliver good quality behavior change interventions. This is a scale called ENACT, which is really measuring those common therapeutic factors for behavior change interventions. Um, and the second thing we also innovated was to look at peer supervision, something that's being used in massive open online courses, where you have peer workers, in fact, rating each other's sessions using the ENACT. Uh, and we found in this particular analysis that peer workers, when you took an average of two or three peer workers, in fact, their ratings were identical to those of the expert who had done the same rating blinded. So in other words, you can now scale up the quality assurance uh, of, of these interventions on a long-term basis by developing uh, peer groups that can actually rate each other's sessions. <laughs>
We have a bunch of uh, more analyses coming up. I'm, ex I'm looking forward to the sustainability analyses, but also the mediation analyses. We had in, in written into the whole design an, a, a, a mediation analysis to look at whether, in fact, uh, our hypothesized mediators that I had mentioned earlier in the theory of change, in fact, uh, were associated uh, with the outcome. Uh, and a variety of other analyses. So at the end of the premium, which I see uh, another year of all these results uh, coming out, what we are going to have is evidence on the effectiveness, cost effectiveness, mediators and moderators of these two treatments, a whole range of manuals and patient resource materials, including an online site, uh, which I will show you in a moment, uh, to learn these treatments, which will be launched on the day that The Lancet publishes the two papers in a few weeks protocols for peer supervision uh, and tools for assessment of therapy quality and of course a fairly simple it looks like a complicated methodology but in fact we were able to simplify it because certain elements of that methodology we realized in hindsight were unnecessary or superfluous so we're going to be writing about that what are the core methodological steps if if we had to do this all over again what are the things we wouldn't do and what are the things we might do more of I want to turn to the second important, uh, there were three important ways of re-engineering psychological treatments. The second important way is transdiagnostic treatments. Now, by transdiagnostic, I simply, at the moment, I'm referring only to anxiety, depression, and trauma-related conditions. These, are, these three groups of conditions are typically um, considered as part of the broad category of mood and anxiety disorders. Now, at the moment, the orthodox model, as I mentioned to you earlier, is that you have to diagnose people with one or the other condition and then choose a specific psychological treatment package for that particular condition. Here's the problem with that approach. The first problem is that this means that any therapist has to learn multiple packages to actually deal with these conditions. Secondly, in the real world, especially I don't mean in the mental health clinics, by which time the severity is quite different, I mean in primary care or in community settings, most people have a mixture of symptoms. It's extremely hard to actually separate out these three groups of conditions. Thirdly, most people with these conditions don't even understand what these diagnoses are, so it's a very tough ask to actually communicate this. And finally, there are, in fact, as I showed you in our analysis of the, meta and, uh, the systematic review at the beginning of my talk, uh, that in fact, it doesn't matter what your primary diagnosis is, most of the treatment packages are delivering often very similar kinds of active treatment strategies. So for quite a while now, and much of this work is happening in the West, but there is one very good trial that has just been published from the developing world. Um, much of this work has been driven from the US, uh, where very innovative people like David Barlow um, has been working on the idea that a common mechanism, a common uh, way of explaining both mood and anxiety disorders can be then targeted through a single intervention, what he calls a unified protocol. And then there's the slightly different approach, which says that you assess a person and if they've got a lot of depressive symptoms, you use behavioral activation. If they've got a lot of anxiety symptoms, you use uh, exposure, for example, or relaxation, and so on. So you match uh, treatment elements according to uh, the main complaint or the main set of symptoms they have. This is called the common elements approach. So these are two quite different ways of thinking about transdiagnostic, but they both aim to train a therapist in just one form of treatment, uh, and the idea is that that person can then treat a very wide range of conditions. Now, I wasn't quite sure which approach to adopt in my own work, uh, um, but the approach of common elements is the first of the block, as it were, when it comes to evaluation in the developing world. Now, there are three randomized control trials of this, all coming from the same group, led by Paul Bolton uh, and Laura Murray and Johns Hopkins. The first, uh, this is the first of them to be published. Uh, there are actually two more trials, one from Iraq uh, and one from South Sudan. Now, Paul's group is a very interesting group. It works in humanitarian context, so all their grants uh, are really to work with conflict-affected populations. Uh, and so in this particular instance, the conflict-affected population is at the border of Thailand and Myanmar, um, where these are Myanmarese um, uh, sort of ethnic minorities who are escaping uh, a conflict uh, and live on camps along the border of Thailand and Burma. They also have, in addition to uh, a lot of trauma, they also have a high rate of, s of uh, substance use, of HIV, intravenous drug use, etc. So it's a, it's a very unstable and difficult uh, uh, social circumstances. So they chose 347 individuals who had really had very general distress-based criteria, no diagnoses needed. Uh, so they had reported trauma exposure and met 
basically symptom severity thresholds uh, for, for, for anxiety and post-traumatic stress. And importantly, uh, the intervention, the common elements intervention that I mentioned earlier, uh, was delivered by lay people. The same model uh, that's been used in other areas of global mental health. So this is what, it's a very complex looking package of, of, of strategies, but this is what the lay councils were trained in. Essentially, they're trained in this set of different elements, or you know, these words are used interchangeably, elements, components, strategies, uh, but they're very specific, goal-oriented psychological treatment techniques. It's not a whole package. You can take out these elements uh, from the package and deliver just one or two or three, uh, depending on the specific needs of that particular individual and their response. So this is the common elements treatment intervention uh, that was evaluated. And then what they looked at was the, was the impact across a range of different uh, psychological health domains. And so here you can see the effect sizes, very large. This was a randomized control trial. I mean, extraordinarily large effect sizes, actually. Um, you know, effect sizes exceeding one for both depression and trauma-related symptoms, uh, and also very, very high effect sizes for both, uh, in a, in a, in a, uh, for both anxiety uh, as well as for, for function scores. So a very exciting new piece of evidence that is also supporting the idea that a single treatment package in which you train health workers in a set of specific techniques, well applied to a very heterogeneous group of patients, can result in improvements across the psychological treatment domains. Well, I've been very inspired by this work, uh, and uh, my, my current Welcome Trust program in India is using the principles of premium as well as the principles of common elements uh, uh, approach uh, to essentially work with young people. Young people, of course, are a really exciting group to work with because this is the age in which most mood and anxiety disorders have their onset. Uh, and because also conduct disorders, behavior disorders, often many of these young people also have mood and anxiety symptoms. So it's very hard to separate all of these uh, diagnoses out in, in, in young people. Um, and of course, young people uh, uh, represent a very large group of people in India. India currently has about two to three hundred million uh, uh, young people. This is when most mental illness begins. It's a really important demographic group for me to work with. So we use the premium design approaches uh, for scalability, but also adopt and integrate uh, the work of Laura Murray and her team um, uh, to bro bring on board the common elements approach. We're, we're really uh, just at the very early, early stage of this. Uh, we're just beginning. Uh, we're really at step one and moving into step two of the premium approach. Uh, uh, so long way to go before I have results uh, that I can present as I did for premium. I want to finish off then with the third important uh, way of re-engineering uh, psychological treatments, and this is, of course, the digital revolution. The digital revolution is transforming uh, the way we think uh, about psychological treatments. Very recently, we, we did a, a very brief overview of what, are, what is the evidence around digital treatments uh, that will, will soon be uh, published in Behavioral Research and Therapy. Um, and we found very good evidence, in fact, that direct-to-user digital treatments were not only popular, but they were really good for certain hard-to-reach groups like young people. Uh, young people do not like to, uh, to, to come to clinics. Uh, yesterday I was with a colleague from Brazil, a child adolescent psychiatrist, who described how the Brazilian government had invested heavily in setting up uh, clinics for young people with mental health problems. Their problem now was there were no young people in the clinics. Uh, because young people don't like coming to hospitals, and l even less so coming to a place that says, mental health center. So this is uh, the, the reason, you know, digital treatments really are exciting for young people, of course, is also that young people have embraced technology more than any other demographic group. Uh, the second and third bullet points uh, really reflect the kinds of support that these digital treatments require to achieve the best effects. There's very clear evidence that guided self-care is much more effective than just someone going onto an app and doing things on their own. Uh, with guidance, the person is more likely to complete treatment. And very importantly, with guidance, when there have been head-to-head -head comparisons comparing digital treatments with face-to-face -face treatments, they both seem to have equal effectiveness. So this is also a very important result, the idea that with appropriate guidance, which is often remote, uh, you can get the same clinical benefits.
So some of the other applications uh, that are mentioned in the case of premium um, online learning of uh, treatments is a, another very important uh, uh, research area still. It has to be said, uh, people have already started evaluating face-to-face -face learning of treatments with online learning of treatments. What evidence does exist, it's brief, is that there is little difference in competencies. In other words, you can train people on the web to learn a new psychological treatment almost as well, at least that's what the primary evidence suggests, uh, as, 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 as uh, having a face-to-face -face workshop. So with that in mind, we will launch in three or four weeks both the Healthy Activity Program and the Counseling for Alcohol Problems uh, learning sites, which will be complete uh, with videos, role plays, as well as with self-assessments uh, as a way for people who are interested at least to get a flavor of what these treatments are to go directly on the internet uh, and, 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 and test it out for themselves. Finally, um, I want to just tell you about my, my, uh, my vision with Pride, um, working very closely with Chris Fairburn and others in the digital space. I imagine a kind of a future, this might be really uh, uh, much into the future, but it's time to start planning for that, is to pull together all these digital opportunities into creating an almost completely paper-free environment in which mental health care can be delivered, particularly in the realm of psychological treatments. So we have started building the architecture of such a digital platform in India uh, with four important pieces. The first piece is self-guided self-care, so uh, apps that can actually enable young people to directly access uh, a website where they can assess their mental health, give carefully tailored advice about uh, their mental health problem, and then an intervention. A training pr uh, online learning platform for people who want to learn how to deliver more formal, more complex psychotherapies like the common elements therapy. A social network site where those who have completed the learning can network with others who have completed the, uh, the, the training to form peer supervision uh, uh, sites, very much like any other social network site. And the fourth is an electronic medical record system that acts as the hub in which all of the information around individuals from self-care and those uh, as well as the delivery of psychological treatments uh, uh, by counselors can all be uh, integrated fully. So. I have only a couple of slides left. I want to now just finish by looking at how the evidence on all th th this vast body of evidence, really, from the developing world, what implications does it have for global mental health? And as you can see here, uh, I have now uh, highlighted the word global because now I want to shift uh, in these last couple of slides to this country, for example, or countries like this, uh, because this is also part of global health. Um, and examine in what ways can this knowledge base have any relevance uh, to the kind of ways in which mental health care is organized and delivered in very well-resourced countries. And to do that, first of all, I want to just show you what the uh, treatment gap is for mood and anxiety disorders. Actually, this is DSM-IV mood and anxiety disorders only. It's not all mental disorders. This comes from the World Mental Health Surveys, which are cross-section surveys done in dozens of countries around the world. This is a fairly old uh, analysis, uh, so there are many more countries now. And they've organized countries into low-income, middle-income, and high-income. I don't think Sweden is in there yet, but I'm sure Sweden will be in there in the latest version of this slide. Now, if you look at the treatment uh, uh, of, um, this is for moderately moderate to severe anxiety and depression, it doesn't come as a surprise that, for example, Nigeria and China, uh, only about 10 to 20 percent of people uh, with moderate to severe depression anxiety have received uh, any treatment in the last 12 months. What is a little bit more surprising is how high the treatment gaps are for countries which are, have a hundredfold more resources than Nigeria or, or, or China does. Uh, countries in which mental health care is provided in a universal health care format, that is to say no one pays for it, which is not the case with Nigeria and China where everyone has to pay for it. Um, and countries in which actually the discourse on mental health is certainly not as naive as it is in China or in, in, in Nigeria. In other words, it seems to me that even in countries with every resource in place, with supposedly not that much demand side barriers because mental health literacy is much higher, about half of all the individuals at the extreme end of the spectrum of depression and anxiety have not received or sought any care in the past 12 months. This seems to me a really important challenge. And I believe that this in part 
the lack of access, the, l the relatively low treatment uh, coverage, uh, the high treatment gaps in these countries is, in my view, and I'm going to be provocative as I end my talk, is because I think that a lot of mental health care in this part of the world has become over-professionalized. Um, the language that we use is alienating, is threatening, is stigmatizing. The interventions always require a formal assessment that must include a diagnosis, even though the whole world knows that we mental health professionals can't agree on what is the right diagnostic system. We often completely uh, focus on biomedical solutions rather than really thinking about mental illness as a profound interaction between people's social worlds and their brains, and so therefore thinking also about interventions within people's social worlds that often includes mobilizing their own personal resources and those of their communities. And of course, I always keep talking about language and concepts. I really do think that how we use language is a tremendously important part of the way we reach out uh, into communities. And the more we continue to use alienating and complex language, I think we will continue to face these barriers uh, to mental health care. And I think in many of these ways, uh, the innovators around the world in that have tried to sort of summarize their, their incredible work here t t this, this afternoon uh, really have, have a priori decided that they're not going to go the same route. A priori, they can't go through the same route. They have to think in a dr dramatically different way if they're going to improve access to mental health care in these populations. Um, this is, in fact, exactly what the Institute of Medicine, incredibly, the world's richest resource country in mental health care is the US, of course. And the Institute of Medicine, which is the US's apex body of medicine, uh, which, you know, puts together every year a few think tanks to look at some major issues of concern uh, for the US, uh, produced uh, this, uh, this really seminal report on psychosocial interventions for mental and substance use disorders. And if you actually read what the recommendations of the report are, they're exactly consistent with what is happening in countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So I just want to thank uh, a few people who've helped me with some of the slides and thank you all for your patience, and I believe there will be some time for questions. Thank you very much.